history of ceramics in Southeast Asia very briefly, and then go on and talk about specifically the site we're going to be looking at, which on that site. Now, this picture here is actually of a, taken of a wat in Sanria, um, Cambodia, and it's uh, the, the abbot here has an extraordinary collection of Khmer pottery. So even in, of course, uh, even specifically in many Buddhist monasteries in Southeast Asia, the Wats will have little museums, little collection of artifacts given to them by local villagers. Often they are antiquities. Some of them are quite important. A lot of archaeological research has been done in monastery collections in Thailand, for example. And uh, this particular abbot has uh, baskets and baskets and shells, cases full of ancient pottery from various sites in northwestern Cambodia. So this is a subject which is of general interest to a large proportion of the Southeast Asian population. Um, the uh, traditional production of ceramics in many parts of Southeast Asia is still a major part-time occupation by many rural people. So uh, it's, a, it's a field in which uh, the subject of style, the stylistic study, is a um, rather uh, quite underdeveloped, but it is one of the major future subjects which archaeologists will work on. So, the, of course, ceramics are first developed in Southeast Asia during the late Paleolithic period. The oldest dates now have been pushed back in northeastern China, uh, sorry, south of southeastern China, uh, to about uh, 15,000 years ago. And before that, we used to think the ones from Japan, the kind of pre jomo uh, sites were the oldest, and the, now there's a, there's a kind of competition between Japan and China to see which can find the oldest ceramics. But the key point is that we usually think of pottery as being developed during the Neolithic period, when people were already settled, living on farms, growing their own crops. We now know that late Paleolithic hunter-gatherers were also making pottery. Uh, they were probably living already in semi-sedentary conditions. They must have already been um, specializing in sea, seafood, basically. You can have huge shell middens uh, from the Paleolithic period. So people are already probably establishing themselves, settling down in places like North Sumatra, <laughs> like near Maidan, where there are those shell middens, which may go back five or 6,000 years. So that seems to have been the kind of context in which pottery already appeared, uh, at least 5,000 years or more before agriculture and the Neolithic way of life uh, began. Now, in, south, south, uh, the, but, uh, in Southeast Asia, it seems like ceramics only appear, um, well, the, the oldest site we know of now with a kind of Neolithic type adaptation assemblage is Dabut from um, Northeast Vietnam. I thought I had a arrow in there. So, Northeast Vietnam, not so far from Hanoi, the Dabut site, the Shell Midden site, <coughs> indicating probably people living off a of seafood. Um, in the shell middens, you have this basket of pressed pottery from about 3,000 to 4,500 years ago, but no sign of agriculture yet. Um, the site itself goes back to 6,000 years, which is about 1,000 years later than the South China Neolithic began. Now, it used to be thought that Spirit Cave in northwest Thailand had the oldest pottery in Southeast Asia. Chester Gormans were there. Um, suggested that pottery there might be as old as 8,000 years. They were under 7,500 years. But now it's um, basically accepted that he, his dates were far too old and that those uh, shirts are only about 3,000 years old. So we have to throw out the Spirit Cave dates for pottery. Um, and uh, so that's mainland. And now uh, island Indonesia, Luzon in Indonesia, we have a few sites now going back about 4,000 years. So not as old as uh, the North Vietnamese sites, but they're in the same general area, same general area, uh, speaking chronologically. So Southeast Asian pottery has been around for at least 4,000 years, in other words, quite a long span of time. Um, one of the oldest uh, questions, of course, is the origin method, whether, or whether it's a, a indigenous invention or whether it was a, a result of external Influences, these are uh, pots from this Bangkok complex in southern and western Thailand. And um, they have tripods. And um, I was just looking at the, the book here from you, <laughs> Shan Dong, you have tripods in here. Again, it's usually associated with the Mong Shan yeah. culture. I mean, 
Yeah, so early Neolithic period. And uh, now the, the sites in, uh, in, uh, the, in China, I mean in the northeast and eastern side, and it's this black polished ware, and they have tripods, and then suddenly about 3,000 kilometers further away, you get tripods and black polished ware also. So the question obviously arises, how could, was there a connection? Um, it's, well, there's nothing in between, which would suggest any kind of communication at that point. So this is one of these areas where stylistic similarities may or may not be indicative of any kind of communication. We just cannot answer questions like this at this point. What was the relation between South China and Southeast Asia in the Neolithic period? Most of the recent scholars such as uh, Charles Hyam, uh, Peter Bellwood do believe that there was a migration from Southeast China into Vietnam and uh, Laos, Northeast Thailand, which, did, which brought about the development of agriculture. And uh, pottery may well have been associated with that. But um, that's a kind of sensitive topic right now. Um, there still needs to be a lot more work done in that region along the borderlands. And of course, at this time, 7,000, 6,000, even 2,000 years ago, South China was still Southeast Asia. The culture was a Yue type culture. The people were more related to the modern Vietnamese and Thai than they were to the Chinese. Their languages, um, their agricultural tools, they're all similar to the first time in Southeast Asia. So the question is quite a complicated one. The origins of Southeast Asian pottery. Some of the most famous sites in the region, uh, like uh, Ban Qian, they're associated more with the early metal age, not the pre-metal Neolithic period, but there's already getting into the bronze period. Ban Qian, again, is another site in Thailand, which was originally dated much earlier than we now believe its age is. It's not, it's not probably as old as the, 3000 BC or something like that, and maybe 1000 BC, about 3000 years ago. Um, still, its pottery already displays a very distinctive local style. That's the important thing. And whatever its origins were, its later development was very specific to this current part of Southeast Asia. And so, obviously, it had been developing local characteristics. Um, Banadi, another famous site that uh, the uh, uh, early Neolithic site in South Korea, um, Eastern Thailand. Um, again, a lot of important styles already. The, the pottery styles are very complex, but unfortunately, almost all of these samples we have come from burials, graveyards. They're not from actual habitation sites. So this leads to the question, were these only made for ceremonial, ritual purposes, for burial offerings, or were they used in daily life by the people. We don't know. So far, all the sites that people like Charles Hyam want to dig are burial sites, because you get a lot of intact items in them. Um, habitation sites still are quite rare, almost non-existent for this time. Paul D, another site with some of the earliest pottery, so far dated in Southeast Asia. It's mainly from that border region between Thailand and Cambodia. And you can see the different styles of the drawing of pottery well-known um, illustrations of really Southeast Asian pottery. If any of you have done any work on Southeast Asian Neolithic, you'll have seen these pots depicted. Um, so this is one thing you should start to look at if you're going to get involved in pottery at all, is how do archaeologists represent pots with the kind of outside and the, exter the exteriors and the interiors, the profiles. A lot of the pots we'll be digging up in the Chilmet, for example, are going to be very fragmentary and you'll only be able to reconstruct small portions of them. Okay, cultural significance in Southeast Asia. Um, despite the fact that ceramics here do have a very long history, 4,000 years, in one way, pottery was not as culturally significant as it was in most other major civilizations in the world, such as China, India, even Central America. I spent one summer working in Honduras on a Maya site, or a group of Maya sites, so I had to have some experience. My, my PhD supervisor was actually a Maya specialist. We didn't, I went to Cornell, we didn't have any Southeast Asian archaeologists there. We had a Southeast Asian art historian, Stan Connor. We had Southeast Asian historians, no Southeast Asian archaeologists. So um, 
Well, culturally speaking, Southeast Asia has many alternatives to clay, including bamboo. Um, the, the lower left here, these are tubes of bamboo used for cooking rice. This is still done quite commonly in many parts of Southeast Asia. Bamboo is not going to leave any archaeological remains. And so a lot of the early uh, functions that were played by clay in other parts of the world in Southeast Asia, they had alternative perishable organic materials. So there was competition, in other words, between pottery and other kinds of media for artistic expression. But Southeast Asia, we know also, was, in, was extremely important uh, in the, the early development of a form of agriculture. Many plants we now think of as worldwide crops actually were first domesticated in Southeast Asia. The banana, those things at the right. Bananas, coconuts, sugar cane, yams, millet, or not millet, sorry, that's uh, sago over there. All these are Southeast Asian plants, which later on got spread around after 1500. Um, so the, now people think of them as being, say, Central America, <laughs> like the banana. Everybody thinks of bananas as being from Central America, because that's where America gets all its bananas from. But in fact, it came from Southeast Asia. It was only transplanted there after 1500. So this region has actually had a lot of unique characteristics based on the local environment. And then the role of pottery within this cultural um, universe in, South, in Southeast Asia is quite different. Not to say that it wasn't important, but it evolved in a rather different technological context from the way pottery evolved in other parts of the world, where it was more significant. Um, but then even in the Near East, for example, in, when we think of it as being the cradle of Neolithic civilization, there's a pre-pottery Neolithic there. So pottery doesn't correlate necessarily with farming. We now know that that's a separate technological development. And only later did that get infused uh, into the agricultural way of life. Now, much of our early data on Southeast Asian pottery comes from ceremonial sites, burials. Uh, one of the most famous groups is known as the Sahuin Kalanai group of pots. Uh, again, this is called this because Sahuin is in uh, South Vietnam, Kalanai is in the Philippines. There's a lot of strong similarity between those two areas in the late prehistoric and early historic eras. And the pots there, we find mainly in burials again. So the question is, to what extent were these used in daily life? We do know that in early Southeast Asian art, when we begin to get, we begin to get representational art, pottery was a symbol of wealth. We look at some Borobudur, for example. This is a so-called Purnagata, these big jars found on the Borobudur release, 9th century. And they're usually symbol, symbols of heaven. So there's a strong connection here between heaven ideas of what you would find in the ideal uh, life and lots and lots of pottery. So it is, it is connected with some kind of uh, idea of um, prosperity. This is also found in India. So we can't say that this is purely a Southeast Asian means of symbol, symbolizing prosperity. Uh, but we will see that there is a very strong parallel within Southeast Asia alone. So here we have these pots here on the walls of Borobudur. They represent wealth and just general um, well-being. There are all kinds of very interesting ways in which pottery was used in Southeast Asia that we don't find in other regions. Wild pottery is burial offerings, very common around the world. Here you have, again, pottery in the lower left, another Borobudur relief. Here is a wealthy person showing something in a pot. There are pots underneath the platform they're sitting on. Uh, pottery is very commonly depicted in these early 9th century depictions of all kinds of life in palaces and in the common um, rural areas as well. It was universal. But upper left here, this is a musical instrument made from a pot. This is an old Japanese instrument. I don't know if it still exists anymore, but basically it consists of a long string. It's about three meters. She had a long, long string. It's stretched out from right to left, and then it sits on top of a little wooden diaphragm, basically. Um, um, I know at least one of you is very interested in music, music here. Um, uh, Misaki, Misaki, you're the musician. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you didn't bring your synthesizer, though, did you? <laughs> so 
Um, this is an old Japanese instrument made out of a pot. So the pot is stuck in the ground and becomes a vibrator. They have this long, long string which you can pluck and it produces very low but very penetrating sounds. So pottery in Southeast Asia has been adapted to a lot of functions you might not expect to find it in, in other parts of the world. Uh, pots are often found in modern ceremonial and religious contexts. This is the Royal Burial Ground in Central Java, near Jakarta and Ohiri. Now there are four huge water jars there which have a semi-sacred significance. They are made in Southeast Asia. Some probably come from Myanmar, from Artaban, some have come from Singhuri in Thailand. But they've been uh, in Java for at least four or five hundred years. So there's a lot of the use of Southeast Asian pottery also. Uh, it was being transferred around Southeast Asia. There was a commerce in Southeast Asian pottery. We know nothing about this historically. It's not mentioned in any documents, no texts. Um, and we've only begun to realize this. Well, first I did some studies on some pots we found here in Orkhanic. They resemble things we found in South Thailand. I eventually did some EDXRF tests on them. So they probably did come from some in Thailand. There are other similar ones found in Cambodia as well. It's probably made in the southern Mekong area. Um, shipwrecks. The recent uh, discoveries of many shipwrecks in the South China Sea, Java Sea, have turned up many, many examples of Southeast Asian pots being sent around as part of the cargoes, along with Chinese work. So we're gradually beginning to realize that there was a whole industry in producing pots in Southeast Asia for export in the classic period. But of course, they were used in many other kinds of situations. Here we have uh, Chinese jars being used in long houses in Borneo as a ceremonial containers for brewing rice wine. We know it was one of the activities done in 14th century Singapore. They were making, according to Wang Dalian, the first Chinese merchant to write about visiting Singapore in the 14th century. Have you heard of him before Wang Dalian? This is 1349. Okay, he's not very famous in China, but he is very important. After your period. <laughs> yes. So he was the first Chinese merchant to write about his uh, travels in Southeast Asia. They, he mentions uh, Singapore in the name Tomasi, Tamasi. And uh, he mentioned that the Singapore is already brewing rice wine at this time, making some kind of fermented spirits. And this is still an important activity in places like Borneo. And now they use Chinese jars, but they've become incorporated into Southeast Asian culture. The jars there are used for things like buying brides. You have to have these specific Chinese jars to buy to, to, uh, as, as a kind of exchange with the, the family of the bride. They brew rice wine, which is uh, consumed in various uh, ceremonies, rituals. Just in Singapore alone, um, we know that uh, there were hundreds of these jars in the 14th century. We found many thousands of fragments of them. Um, we can't say for sure that they were being used for rice wine brewing, but it's probably one of the things they were um, functioning as. So many, many specifically Southeast Asian cultural activities involved the use of ceramics, both local and for as here. And uh, they made special containers. This is Adam Malik, the old vice president of Indonesia who came from North Sumatra. This is in an old uh, house in North Sumatra in the Patak Highlands. And, you, and this uh, pattern of actually having preserved the large plates hung on the walls of the longhouses was very common in Sumatra until the early 20th century, after which foreigners came in and bought them all. <laughs> and so they're all gone now. But this is a, um, Adam Malik was a big collector of ceramics. And so he actually um, had a very good collection, which was dispersed, unfortunately, after he died. But this is the traditional means of preserving them, is by actually weaving these rotund containers for them and hanging them on the walls of the houses as kind of probably status symbols. They're used in royal ceremonies all over Southeast Asia. We know that the early sultans and rajas of, in, of Southeast Asia had their own collections of pottery, both Chinese and local. Here they're being used in a kind of uh, uh, dance performances. We have the Tari Piring, the plight dance, and then in Malay and other parts of Southeast Asia. So ceramics ful fulfill many functions besides just uh, those of containing food and uh, water, in other words.